Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of At The Movies. Um, as usual, we are here to discuss going to the movies, um, why we think that experience is so impactful, and of course, what it means as an exhibitor to bring that experience to an audience. Um, so today, uh, Brandon brought uh, a guest with us. Do you want to tell us who you brought, Brandon? Yeah, um, Tim Patton is, you know, been in this industry a long time. I'll let him give his his deep bio, but uh, been a friend of mine and been a friend of the exhibition community for a long time. Uh, he is, in theory, a film booker or a film buyer and owns Cinema Services. So, Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks. And if you just want to jump in and and give us what all that means. Hmm. Gee, where do I where do I begin with something like this to make it interesting on a on a podcast? That's uh, and in today's world, right? Like and in today's <laughs> this is a and mess. in today's world. How did I how did I get into this mess? Is really, how did really anyone confident. get into this mess? <laughs> um, let's see. I you know I, I call myself a one trick pony because uh, I've been doing this my entire life. I started working in movie theaters when I was sixteen years old. Uh, I went to college to learn how to make movies, figured out it wasn't Steven Spielberg. Went back to doing what I, what I knew what to do, knew, how, knew what to do in terms of exhibition. Um, I started in the industry when I lived in Boston, uh, and I worked for a non-theatrical distributor there called Wholesome Films. It was a really unique experience because it was right off the Boston Common area in an old film row section of town. And uh, so my introduction to film distribution uh, was, was, uh, uh, was selling films, uh, 16 millimeter films to uh, nursing homes, uh, day schools, uh, you know, some, you know, all, all older titles that uh, before video was even around. This would be back in the early 80s, 1981, 80, 81. Uh, after I'd gotten out of school. So um, that was an interesting experience. I was in inspecting films, selling films. Um, and uh, my connections in working for United Artists Theaters when I was 16 years old actually paid off because there was a, a friend of mine that had become a general sales manager at, at Universal Pictures, Ben Kamek. And uh, he helped uh, introduce me to some people in the industry and in film buying and film exhibition, and uh, and uh, I started out uh, be at uh, Columbia Pictures as a gross clerk, and uh, that introduction came from uh, the person that actually started Cinema Service Company, uh, Bill Slaughter, who uh, helped open a lot of doors for me in the Dallas area with uh, distributors and uh, exhibitors alike. So I worked for Columbia for a while, for nine months. I was a film buyer, assistant gen uh, film buyer at General Cinema for three years. Um, then after that, I went to De Laurentiis Entertainment in the uh, mid eighties. I was there for probably two and a half years. Then I went to MGM, I was there. And then I moved out to LA, worked for Act Three Theaters for about three years in Los Angeles and then 1991, I ended up, it sounds like I can't hold on to a job, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> Welcome to the movie business. Exactly. It's one, it's one title at a time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so then I, I, I lived in LA for roughly three years, and then I had an opportunity to move back and be, become partners in Cinema Service Company uh, with, my, with, uh, with Mr. Slaughter and with his son, Rick, and a good friend of mine, Bill Herding. You know, we do programming for the theaters. We negotiate their deals. We, uh, we, we handle everything from soup to nuts. So if you're going to build a theater, we can certainly act as a consultant and connect you with the right people uh, in order to build a theater. And not, not that anybody's going to be building any theaters anytime soon. There's going to be a lot of probably theaters available. But, uh, but I don't think there's any need to build anything anymore right now. But... Uh, so we, we basically handle it all. We got seven people here, including myself, and uh, it's a lot of fun. We, we were probably booking films in 20, 22 states, I, I guess, and about eight to 900 screens. So let's talk about the size of your company first. When you talk eight or 900 screens, 
Um, where would that put you if, if you were viewed as an exhibitor that would make you the what number or what's the, what kind of market share would that mean? Uh, the market share isn't as big as, as the, the size of the delivery that we can make to uh, film companies when they're requesting to, uh, to, uh, for a first run film to go into our theater. So, um, you know, market share in terms of, how big our pseudo circuit would be, it, it's, it would probably be number five or six, I would guess. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, maybe in that range. Um, you know, there's some other sur- uh, film buying agencies out there that are about the same size that we are. Uh, we're all in about the same boat. Um, and that puts them, they probably might have a little more market share than we do. We might have a few more screens than they do. Um, they might deliver fewer runs to a, uh, a film company than we can. Um, so, uh, you know, there's probably about three of us, I think that are about the same size. And what, what does your typical, or maybe there isn't a typical exhibitor, but what, what, do, what do your clients look like? Who, who are some of the unique ones? Gosh. Um, and, and what experiences are they delivering um, that you find to be unique? Yeah, you know, let's, we, our clients are very diverse in terms of what they do. So Anywhere from single screen operators to multi-unit? We, we, we represent the guy that plows the back 40 in the day and turns on the projector bulb at night. So uh, that's the Ma and Pa toothpick chains that are in the Texas area. We, we represent a lot of those guys. Uh, that's really the a lot of the backbone of what we do, but and you can plug them. We don't we don't mind. We're here to share exhibitors, <laughs> oh, so absolutely. please feel free to mention them all. We'll put them up. We'll put links to them in in the in the show notes. <laughs> well, there's a lot of those. I mean, and and there's nonprofits too that we represent. So who's one of the little guys? That's the the single screen or the single location. Like who who is? What does that look like? Because we we definitely want to send people there. Gosh, where do I send them? I'll tell you, I got a great example. Uh, There's a lady, Tammy Steinem, in the town of Yoakum, Texas. And she had a dormant theater that she purchased in the town. And uh, and she reopened it. I think she's a school teacher in the daytime. And she runs the theater at night. And uh, I, I would have guessed... In Yoakum, Texas, there's maybe 1,700, 2,000 people, but you know they have a surrounding community that uh, that uh, supports the theater. But when she took over the theater and decided to put a little money into it and spruce it up, it had been dead for a while, a long time. And I have to say, she's a shining example of somebody that has resurrected a town, and the theater does quite well. The town supports it. She even added a screen, another screen about a year ago. Um, so she does a fantastic job and gets a lot of support out there. Um, I'd if say you're wondering she, where Yoakum, Texas is. It is west of Houston mm-hmm. and south. Uh, it, it sits between Houston and San Antonio, kind of south of Austin. So if you're looking for it on the map and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, wouldn't this be a great road trip if I had an extra four hours and 15 minutes? Uh, maybe uh, you could figure out a way to go by to Brenham, Texas and get some Bluebell ice cream on your way to Yoakum, you know? That would be... Yes. Uh, we I'm know much the further away than that. Bluebell very well. <laughs> I, okay, so Yoakum, Texas. Yeah. And what is the name of her... What's the name of her the theater? Grand, the Grand Theater in Yoakum, Texas. The grand thing. So that's, that's perfect. And they're first run. They are when we can get first run, you know, commercially, they, they, uh, they do real well in the meat and potato films. Uh, you know, if you have a wonder woman or a black widow or, or a Pixar movie, you know, those are going to be their bread and butter for sure. And then who's somebody kind of as a, a, a smaller midsize exhibitor for you? Hmm. Well, that's uh, you know, we probably represent, quite a few of those. I mean, I wouldn't put them as, as necessarily small, but I'd say strong regional players overall. We have, um, I think the most concentrated circuit that we book 
for is the Santico circuit in San Antonio where they have, uh, I think it's nine theaters and uh, in the area and they're great theaters. I mean, they're top they're, 25. They're palaces. They're I mean, palaces. They're, they, they're, they're beautiful. Top 25 theaters in the nation on grosses when they come out. Uh, the founder of Santicos Theaters, John Santicos, when he built those theaters, he spared no expense. He was an incredible operator. He, he died about, I want to say, four years ago, maybe. Uh, maybe longer ago than that. Maybe five. Um, but he left a legacy in that town that is unforgettable. And what's really great about the Santicos organization is it's, uh, it's owned by a trust that is very unusual in our business. And for every ticket that per is purchased at a Santicos theater, they give back to the community. There's probably anywhere from, I would say, eight different charitable organizations where the funds are dispersed throughout the community of San Antonio. So when you go to a theater in San Antonio, you're actually supporting the city. Wow, that's, that's great. Awesome. And, and I think that that just shows, and that's a great job of, uh, well done on the Santico's part. But I mean, I think that demonstrates how important movie theaters are to their community. I mean, you've given us two great examples from a, from a small independent to a regional player and, and how one, that the movie theater can revitalize a town and become kind of a centerpiece to it. And then even in a bigger town like San Antonio, you have a committed organization like Santico's who continues to give back. And I'll, I'll mention one other thing. We've talked about this on the show is that we've, we talk about creating jobs and how many first jobs or early jobs begin, like you said, Tim, even yours was in the movie theater. Mm -hmm. and, and what an incredible place that is that so many people have that starting point and that, and that movie theaters are a central part of the economic driver to these communities. They very much are. Uh, you know, there's, not a, there's probably not a better example in the United States than what Santico's, uh, the legacy that he left in the town and how he set it up uh, how he set the trust up to be run. And, uh, and, and it, it is a fantastic thing that they do for the community. There's no doubt. And I would also say they were one of the first out, uh, first to reopen uh, during the pandemic. They were very early on. They were very bold about it. I thought they put together a great informational piece um, about what to expect and the changes. And, and a lot of that became, you know, a first rep for, for other movie theaters. So it, it feels like Santico's is one of those that's innovative, um, that, that really cares. Um, and, and again, just because you have nine locations doesn't mean you're not leading the way uh, in exhibition. Yeah, I, uh, you know, the, the CEO there, Tim Handren, uh, was very uh, specific about how he wanted to reopen his theaters. And when uh, the governor of Texas gave a green light to for theaters to reopen, whether we had product or not. He wanted to make sure that he was uh, front and center in terms of uh, protocol, safety guidelines in his theater, and uh, the messaging that he wanted to send to this community is that they were there, they were open, come by, you know, try us out. I mean, he, he did a great job of uh, just posting a video of himself in front of the, in the Palladium and just saying, hey, here we are, here's what we're doing. We want you to feel comfortable. This is the way we're doing it. And uh, come on by, check us out. Yeah, it was well done. Have you been back to a movie theater? And yes, watched I have. A movie? What'd sure. you watch? Well, I watched Tenet. It's amazing in a theater. Didn't It's everything you forgot you missed about going to the movies, I felt like. Just the sound. Yeah, and the... I, I think that... Um, Look, if, if somebody can explain the movie to me, that would be even better. But. Um, remember early on in Tenant, they said, don't try to understand it, just feel it. And I feel like that's what you have to do <laughs> in that movie. Don't try, to, don't try to figure it out, just feel how cool it is. Yeah, I mean, look, we, there were several false starts on Tenant to, re, to relaunch the industry. But you have to take your hats off to Warner, Warner Brothers 
for what they did in turn and Christopher Nolan for pushing uh, it as well and to to kind of relaunch our our business and uh, you know we just need others to follow suit at this point and we need uh, other governments to open up uh, like in in Michigan Scott I mm-hmm. mean, you know I know that's uh, those are difficult calls and and uh, we we continue to have theaters that are shut down in New Mexico in New New Jersey, for various reasons, uh, we have a, even though you can open up, and Maryland is a difficult state to open up in as well, because even though the government might say, okay, it's okay to, to go to 25%, you have to go through another governmental system in Maryland uh, with the counties uh, that, uh, that have to bless that. So the governor doesn't even have the final say in situations like that. We'll get there, I know we will, but we need to get there sooner than later, because LA, New York, San Francisco, and Bigger cities really need to be open at this point for, for there to be a sustainable business right now. I mean, I think down the road we'll, we'll, we'll get there, uh, but, um, but right now it's, it's, uh, it is very important for the Hollywood release schedule to solidify and uh, for things to s- stay in place. And yeah. that's, it's very liquid, as, as everybody knows. These pictures move around like water, so um, it's, it's tough. What do you think it is going to take to get the the general public, the movie going audience to go back to the theaters? Mm. That's a, that is the, the million dollar question, right? Um, well, you have 30 years of experience, so we're leaving <laughs> on you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I have 30 years of experience, but I'm also someone who's 62 and almost 63 years old. And I understand why an older audience might not be ready to come back to a theater. Um, I think that the messaging has to be front and center and it has to be on a national level. It has to come from talent in Hollywood and it has to be broadcasted nationwide on a big marketing as, as you guys would know to announce that we're back open, that our protocols are there, and that, um, and, and that it's safe to come back. And guess what? Here's, here are the movies we have coming. Um, I think it's going to take a real groundswell of support in order to convince people to do that. So the messaging has to be strong. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is I think there is a, a matter of convenience with the public right now. First of all, Tenant was not a four quadrant movie by any means. And can you uh, explain to people what that means? Well, I mean, if you're a uh, male, uh, 18 to 35 and a female, 18 to 35, you fit into two different quadrants. And then the next quad, you know, you have kids that fit into that quadrant and then you have the older crowd that are male and female. So you want a picture that fits into all four of these quadrants that gets everybody in the door. Um, and Tenet was, was not that movie, certainly for probably for us three, it's a, it's a film that, uh, that we're interested in seeing, but maybe females that are 18 years old don't care about it. Uh, so you have to have those m- movies. Wonder Woman would be a great film because I think uh, both males and females of all ages uh, embrace the first Wonder Woman. Uh, that's why it grows so darn much money. Yeah, 105 so, million opening weekend. I mean, that's yeah. that's a big movie. Those are those are big movies. What do you think? The we know Hollywood and the studios play a major part in this because at the end of the day, the the films are the driver. But mm-hmm. what do you think exhibitors need to do? Well, I think they need to continue to do what they're doing, uh, which is messaging to their uh to their loyalty members about how safe it is to come back i think anything they can do in terms of private events private theater rentals i think uh, my hat's off to cinemark for a great job that they have done in uh in their private rental business because they they were first and foremost to kind of come out and and really put put a put a great foot forward uh, in, in terms of offering that for a low price that was really enticing uh, for them to do that. They were, you know, if, if you just wanted to go see a movie by yourself, you could have bought an auditorium for a hundred bucks and you felt very safe in that. I think that those sort of, that sort of creativity is important right now on the exhibition side to make people come back and feel comfortable in, in our buildings. 
So from a programming standpoint, we have to, uh, to drive home private events. So uh, we know that in Texas and, and probably Scott, this isn't happening in Detroit or the Michigan, lower Michigan area right now, but you know, uh, Dallas is leading the nation in people coming back to their offices right now. I heard that figure the other day, which was, I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> I don't know if that's really good or bad or, or, or what to think of it, but it is a statistics that, that is interesting. It says that we're trying to get back to some form of normalcy here. Um, so I think to tap into the corporate events uh, and private events like that and be able to have someone locally that can, that can go, to these, uh, go to these businesses and say, we want you and your business in our theater. That's important as well. That's, a, that's an important ingredient because right now the product isn't going to be the driver. We, we, don't have, we don't have the movies that we need to have in the marketplace to get everybody back in. So we're just going to have to be very specific about how we go out and get that audience back into our doors. All of them. All of them. We don't have any family films in the market because – everybody's written off family films because families don't want to go to theaters. Well, we really don't know. It's a catch 22 because we haven't had a family film released into the marketplace yet. So how do we really know until we do? Yeah. I think the first family film that's currently on the slate is connected from Sony on October 23rd. So that's, that may be the first chance we get to see if that audience is going to be willing to come back. Um, uh, Tim, we are, we are coming up on our time with you. Um, we, we so appreciate you being with us at, at our Thank podcast. So, I, so I've got to ask you two questions to close up here. Um, what is, what is your movie going experience look like when you go to the theater? What rituals do you have? What movies do you like to see? What do you like to snack on? Golly. Well, let's go with the, let's go with the food first. I mean, um, so locally, if I, you know, depending on what theater I do go to, it could be a Cinemark theater, it could be Angelica or an Alamo theater uh, that, that's here. Uh, you know, I like going to, uh, to support everyone. And uh, so what's, what's great about going to any of those theaters is I've got to have popcorn. And I don't want butter on my popcorn. I'm just not a butter person. You know, I'll have a little salt maybe, but you know, I, I, I'm just never been a butter person. So it's always going to be popcorn. When I'm at Alamo, it's always going to be a beer or a drink. So if I can get any kind of alcohol in me, that's always going to be a good starter for the movie. It's a primer for me these days, every day. <laughs> it's, it's, it's how I get through, it's how I get through the day. <laughs> or as I, have to say, I have to drink on the weekends just to forget about the week. <laughs> All right. Do you have a preferred drink when you go? Is it uh, beer, or well, a bourbon, a margarita? What's the, what's the preferred I, I prefer, cocktail? I prefer world? maybe a margarita, just to, I depend on who I'm with. And the time of year. So it's really nice to go to an Alamo theater in the wintertime and get a nice dark beer, uh, you know, to start out. Something that would be nice in that respect. Um, you know, I'm, I, I like going to adult dramas these days. I, I used to be a huge horror fan when I was younger. I read everything that was horror. I saw everything that was horror. And, and I would say that now that I'm a little bit older, uh, although I still like some of the horror movies that are out there, I, it's not my cup of tea. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, little more, uh, a little more serious about what I want to see and, and what I want to see on the screen. And then maybe, uh, maybe I need a good comedy. We all need a good comedy these days. So yeah, absolutely uh, I'd love to see one. Those two genres, unfortunately, have not been uh and do not do very well in movie theaters right now it's usually comic book stuff and uh the marvel stuff which is great i mean it's keeping us alive and family film and the horror stuff does really well but you know when when you start thinking about adult dramas you start thinking about everything that uh that our competition puts out uh the netflix and amazon prime uh that's that's definitely a genre of film that is faded in movie theaters that I'd love to see return mm -hmm. uh, and, and romantic comedies as well. Uh, that's another one that has all but disappeared. It seems like. Well, we'll wrap it up with this last question. Since you said you want to, those are the types of movies you want to see come back. Do you, do you have a particular film that is on the calendar out in the future that you are 
highly anticipating. Wow. <laughs> I mean, mine would be Top it's, Gun. It's actually I've been waiting. Yeah, I've been waiting you know, for Top Gun. I can't wait. Bond, but is there something? You know, Brandon, you're in the '80s. You, what, I mean, how much? You're a lot younger than me, right? I mean, you were you grew up in that '80s era where Top Gun and a lot of these movies. I saw it six you. times in a movie theater. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I saw it at the Dickinson Theater in Kansas City six times. <laughs> uh, you know what? Here's what I'm going to go with. That's a current movie on the schedule. I can't wait to see. It's Death on the Nile. Oh, yeah. Great cast. That's I think awesome. the trailer on that is terrific. Kenneth Brownell, he's just, he can morph into anything that he wants to. I thought he was terrific in Tenet. Hell, I didn't even recognize him right. uh, initially. But, you know, I, I think the trailer on that looks fantastic. I hope it stays on the 23rd of October. That's right in my wheelhouse right now. A good Agatha Christie novel. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Right on. Well, t well Tim, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, and again, thank you for all the hard work and, and bringing people back to movie theaters. Well, th thanks for having me. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. And, and uh, hey, let's, let's, let's hope our industry is, continues to, to move forward and we'll all hang in there, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tim. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, Scott. Brandon.